on now. Alrighty, so unit one business studies is extremely easy. Uh, over the last uh, four or five sessions, I've had getting 100 out of 100 for both unit one and unit two. Um, simply because there's only a few things that you need to cover, most of which is advantages and disadvantages and a few methods. We're going to discuss a few things there and then we're going to take it in together and we're going to understand what we need. So off we go, guys. We're going to look at... <clears throat> Slide, give me a moment. Right. Okay, here we are. This is unit one, quite familiar. If you guys have been studying this unit, you guys have seen this uh, unit, this page in your um, textbook. As you can see, there are only six sections here. It's um, fairly straightforward. It's really easy. There's nothing to it. You have only a few sections. So when you look at a business, you divide a business into their departments. So one of the departments are marketing. Um, the other one is HR. Then you've got finance and fourth one is production. So four of that. And in unit one, you're looking at just two, which is marketing and HR. Finance and production is in unit four. So we're simply dividing up a business and we're seeing what's happening inside a business. Uh, what, what do they do in these departments? So in this case, guys, we've got, as you can see, these three sections will cover marketing and these two sections will cover HR, human resources. So off we go, we're gonna look at a few things. Now, of course, we've got only limited time. So we're gonna pick out only those things that are important to brush your knowledge through. And then we're gonna go forward and look at some advantages, disadvantages, anything. Just a reminder, make note of anything that you need help with, and we'll discuss that towards the end. Um, <clears throat> first things first. The very first chapter, guys, you have something called um, niche market and mass market. By now, you must know all of this, so um, it's not too difficult to understand. I'm just going to give you an example of a product. Uh, if you take mass market, you'd realize that uh, a product like uh, Colgate or Signal toothpaste will be there. As opposed to niche market, they'll sell something like the same toothpaste, something like Sensodyne, which is very particularly for, uh, let's say, sensitive teeth or, or adults or older senior people, things like that. So mass market and niche market. Um, pretty straightforward for you to understand that these mass markets have loads of benefit when it comes to economies of scale because you're producing on mass. When you produce on mass, you can buy um, raw materials on mass and your cost will fall, which means economies of scale is gained. Um, everyone is treated equally. So um, think about this. If you had a marketing campaign and it goes really good, that's enough for all markets. As opposed to using niche markets, you've got to separate your marketing campaigns, make things very particular for them. A uh, whole oh, waste of marketing there, waste of time, waste of money in trying to customize certain things. As opposed to mass market, one for all, one message for all. Yeah. Um, and the thing about this is that there's very small profit margins in the mass market. And you've got to remember there's loads of competitors. So when it comes to loads of competitors there, your margin is going to be really low. But at the same time, guys, you're going to have um, loads of quantity. There's a huge quantity there. So, well, we're working on volume here than it is value. So volume will bring you um, a lot of benefits in terms of uh, even that small profit margin multiplied by the amount of people there. Well, you got a lot. Um, and the best part is you take the whole revenue, pump it into R&D, come up with product innovation, new product development, come up with something new and try to sell it. The whole drawback comes is that it's homogenous. These products are homogenous. When I say homogenous, when you go to a supermarket, um, I don't know if you really have a particular brand for toothpaste or you just pick off whatever's there. So some of the brands that are like Colgate and Signal and all that selling to the mass market, they're really trying to get you how are they trying to get you? How are they trying to attract you very particularly? Because it's all the same. There is no difference. 
So if it's all the same, guys, well, now you realize they try to differentiate in some way to try to keep you there. For example, I use a Colgate toothpaste and Colgate has a transparent red uh, uh, toothpaste instead of the typical white toothpaste. It kind of looks fancy. So I kind of go with that. I don't know why I buy it. It's, it's the same. I, I don't really care if it's Signal or Colgate, but it's a fancy red transparent thing. So I buy that. I, I feel like, okay, this, this feels cool. So I take that. Loads of competition there. So that is, that is a real drawback. And of course, well, when there are sudden changes, you cannot be flexible because you've invested in heavy machinery and um, division of labor, perhaps, and you've invested in all of that. But there'll come a point where you just feel, you know, we can't change. If we change, we've got to change all of existing machinery. So that way you lose out to the small timers who's doing it really well, which we bring ourselves onto niche market. Niche market, the obvious benefits, charge a high price. Sensodyne is highly priced. It's not cheap. Yeah. Um, it's easy to target the market in Sensodyne. Well, I don't know if any of you use Sensodyne, but Sensodyne is really a, a more expensive toothpaste and it's, it's more for those with sensitive teeth or really uh, senior people who'd like to take care of their teeth or worried about the last stages of their teeth. Um, it's small scale production, so it's really flexible. And of course, well, competition is not all that much, but, but demand can go up and down and up and down because it's not like your constant demand when you get the mass market here. It's, it's a little, um, it's a little shaky there. So you're not certain, which is a very uh, difficult deal there. And of course, well, no economies of scale. You don't have economies of scale because your costs are going to be high. Um, that being said, don't think that the niche market doesn't make profits. Niche market makes a lot of profits. For example, if you guys uh, know Louis Vuitton, uh, can you guys see my screen? I'm switching to my browser. Can someone confirm if you can see it? Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at uh, LVMH, Louis Vuitton, you guys must know this brand. It's huge. Yeah. So LVMH is a niche market. And to think that LVMH uh, has all these brands in the niche market, you're talking about, look at every single thing that you see here belongs to LVMH, including the PVR theaters, including Bulgari, including uh, Tag Heuer, uh, Givenchy, Marc Jacobs, uh, even the upmarket liquor, Belvedere, Hennessy, uh, all of these, Christian Dior, Hublot, you name it, all of these belong to LVMH. And if you guys didn't know, LVMH, this guy, Bernard Arnault, is the richest man in the world. At least he was for the last month. Um, world's richest man, Bernard Arnault. Not Jeff Bezos, not Elon Musk, Bernard Arnault, LVMH. This guy is the richest man in the world. Yeah, not... not uh, all your Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates, and not them, this guy. And this guy operates a niche market. So it's it won't be fair to think that niche market doesn't make the profits. Oh, yes, niche market does make the profits. They're really in a huge chunk. As opposed to the guys at Unilever who's on the other side with mass market, both of them have an equal play. But so long as you master it, well, you master it, but you decide where you're going. Like I said, um, when you answer your questions, when they ask you something about niche and mass, <clears throat> you're technically going to be a consultant to them. You're going to speak to them as if you're the consultant, you're the business consultant. So when you write your answer, you got to tell particularly to them. Don't just give me all this. You can charge a premium price and all that. You won't get your marks. If you don't adapt it to that particular case and speak as if you're advising them, you won't get your marks. <clears throat> all righty. So then you've got market share. Now market share is pretty easy. It's what, what is your slice of the cake? If that's the whole cake, what is your slice? So you're simply taking your slice over the total cake into 100 market share. So you're taking total company sales and divided by the total industry sales, pretty straightforward. Something else that you need to know in this first section is um, online retailing. When it comes to online retailing, it's a given. It's pretty straightforward. It's just that some of you forget these points. I mean, if you guys take a glance at these points, you know these things. These are pretty... Um, Obvious, I'm going to put it that way. We live in the online era today. But chances are you may forget them. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a few things here that you uh, will bring your memory back. It's 24-7. Um, 
automatic orders are taken. There is no need to uh, manually sit and take in the order. If you guys don't know what drop shipping is, I suggest you go look at what drop shipping is. You don't need to sit and take every order. You can just simply, um, as someone orders, it automatically goes and places the order which is supplied. There's no human involvement there at all. So go take a look at what that is. Um, <clears throat> You can reach international markets. Your overheads are low. You have no rent, no premises, no any of that. You can change your stock and update your website and everything easily instead of having to uh, look into your shop layouts and whatnot. Very easy to set up. It's very, very flexible and ob obviously it grows very fast. Uh, mind you, we are looking at what? We're looking at the benefits to the business and not to the customer, yeah? So when we're looking at this, because we're advising the business, so don't talk about the benefits to the customers, talk about the benefits to the business. Um, simple drawbacks as well. Um, if, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys have ordered online, but I'm sure you guys have had problems with delivery or someone's delayed your product or something like that. It becomes very difficult after some time. You just feel like, I just don't want it. I, I personally hate online shopping. Why? One, I can't, um, I'm very picky with my clothes. If you say, I like to touch and feel it. And I like to put it on. Do I look good, guys? Well, I like to check it first and then buy it. So I don't want to uh, order something that may not. I mean, I'm very picky. So personally, to me, I don't like it. Um, and I hate waiting three days for del delivery. So-called three days, not three days. They say three days, and then it ends up. So COVID, so crisis, so our delivery partner is on the way. Uh, so we received your order. So this uh, is some excuse, and it comes what within the seven days. And I don't like it. I hate it. I'd rather go pick it up myself. And um, well, if you are going to set it up, you will need some form of IT skills. Yeah. Some customers may not want to put in their uh, details online. If you're anyone like my father, he will not put his credit card online. He'll ask me to put mine. He'll not put his one because he's really afraid. He's, he doesn't want to put it. I mean, it's, it's quite... Uh, it's quite safe to say, yeah. So one day, some my credit card was charged with Netflix, and I didn't even have Netflix at the time. So I had to cancel my credit card and get the money back, and you know all kind of harangue procedures that had to go through. I had to go through because of simple problems with online retailing. Um, and of course, remember, remember the moment you go online, what's going to happen to you? You are now competing with the rest of the world. You're not competing with yourself. If you had a store, you had some form of advantage in that area, but now you're competing with the rest of the world. And well. Be open to fraud, spam, and viruses because that's going to come in. If you think that you're super secure, well, uh, you're not. If banks can get hacked with ransomware and things like that, well, be open to that. You've got to be safe on that as well. Um, well, and all your competitors will know everything about you. Yeah, you can see every single detail. There's no need to come and hide and sneak into your shop. And no, it's just simple. Everything's there. So it's simple stuff there, guys. I'm sure you know this already, but don't forget it. So I've listed it down so you can use it. Um, something else that comes in this section is dynamic market. And dynamic market is things that change constantly. The easiest example that you can take is technology. Technology is in a dynamic market. It, it keeps changing all the time. Uh, COVID change, classes change, everything is online. I mean, I personally feel online can be a better method of teaching because for example, now you just saw me, I, when I wanted to show you an example, I simply flip onto a different screen and show you that as opposed to me teaching you physically where I'm rather giving you the example than showing it to you. So, I mean, I feel personally more effective. So you gotta be ready to adapt. Things change guys. COVID changed everything. The last financial recession that happened in 2008 also changed everything. Markets change dynamically. So you gotta be ready for it. How do you be ready for it? Well, flexibility. If you are not flexible, if you're rigid with your ways, you have made a business plan and you're like, I'm gonna to stick to this. I'm not gonna change anything else. Well, you have a major problem. You're not gonna suit all your customer needs and whatnot. Um, do your market research guys, stay ahead of the game. Yeah, now I'm gonna give you a very, very, very good example. Anyone here from uh, British school? If you're not, I'll tell you what they did before. You know that they already had online classes for some of their uh, modules. They already had online classes. They were already flexible with that. All their teachers were already given dongles and whatnot before this whole COVID even came about. So they did some research and they just stayed ahead of the game. So 
the moment they saw covid stuff they were not in trouble they had every single thing they wanted they were perfectly well and ahead students were used to it uh, teachers were used to it here i'm not even going to ask what happened to your schools all your teachers probably struggled and didn't know how to use certain uh, features on team or zoom or whatever yeah so why struggle if you did your research you stay ahead of the game yeah so if this school can do it i don't see why all the other schools cannot do it yeah um investment in r&d is always important you invest in technology have your system set up have everything done uh if you don't know what r&d is research and development and develop a niche guys all right if i were to tell you we at jade didn't get hit by the pandemic at all why we had a whole bunch of loyal students all you loyal bunch of students stuck to us didn't leave didn't say anything didn't make a fuss we we continued on as we had to go but we developed a niche loyal customers help you so build your niche and of course you must have heard kaizen from unit 2 this is continuous improvement if you had continuous improvement you will be uh well efficient so make sure that you change constantly uh, improve certain things little by little and you will change um so we got that we're moving on to um market research all right market research has primary and secondary data primary is brand new information remember that this information does not exist you got something brand new and secondary existing information something already collected by others so these are certain ways that you can take a look at in terms of what um uh this is certain things that you can take a look at in terms of methods you have in depth interviews surveys focus groups all of these things guys all of these are done by yourself or well you hired your people to do it and these are not these are something that already exists um company websites competitors all of these things but keep in mind that when you start something new it's your first time don't go with this doesn't make sense go with this yeah this is your stepping stone first thing you do pick up your laptop go online search for certain things look at competitors in the area look at all of that use that as your stepping stone so always start with that and then come into this so when you come into this now you can gain more information so basically even for you to do a survey you need to have done some secondary research to gain some sort of um understanding of the market or certain things so always remember this is you what you do at the start and this is second uh, the next thing yeah so primary is something you get on your own we need to look at what benefits and drawbacks this bring i've only listed a few not too many so secondary obviously cheap it's diverse you can take any different means there's so many ways that you can go and obtain information it's readily available um you can define the problem there so basically you can see what you need to go in primary research for based on this when you find out okay these are the things that are missing and well familiar market um the drawbacks of secondary well outdated inadequate sometimes maybe false who's to say somebody publishes some false information hard to control you can't um you can't really control what information is real what information is not all these things are here and right but go on to primary you'd see that these things are up to date these things are adaptive information you can take whatever is relevant to you um and it's not available to competitors it's just yours though i must say it's really high it's really expensive and it's time consuming and it's difficult ask yourself some of you entered some uh, became entrepreneurs already ask yourselves are you able to do primary research do you really think you have the skill to do it uh i'm going to put my head on the line and i'm going to say you don't there's a lot of things you need to learn i mean i studied way past my mba and i'm still struggling to get market research correct you need to be really really skilled as a junior entrepreneur uh, my primary research not the easiest thing to do yeah it's going to be costly it's going to be time consuming all of that's going to come in so that's it to do with primary and secondary something else you need to know is qualitative and quantitative information qualitative well cannot be counted it's all to do with uh, how would you say um uh, opinions beliefs something like that as opposed to quantitative it's more statistical information numbers yeah so simple deviation between the two uh, types of data that you could collect um then comes in market 
mapping. Now, when it comes to market mapping, guys, you have advantages and disadvantages. Look at this market map. This market map is, um, is based on two different aspects. Yeah. So quality and high price. Is, are those the only two that you can use? No, you can change this to anything you want. If you change this to anything you want, you can even put in different. If you take sports cars, you can say more sporty and more retro. So anything that you can go with, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, but there are some advantages and disadvantages. As you can see, guys, it helps you to identify, ah, okay, there's nobody playing in this market. There's nobody playing in this market. Maybe we can start a chocolate and go there. You can also analyze your competitors. Okay, I know so many people here. And you are pushed to use market research. Because you know that, you know, these things are here. Now you can, you have a push to go find out certain other information as well. The drawbacks though, guys, just because there's a gap. Look at this gap here. High price, low quality. Do you think it's viable to produce that? Just because there's a gap doesn't mean that there's demand. Nobody would pay higher price for a low quality thing. Completely off, yeah? So, and of course, well, just because you do the market map does not mean that you're going to guarantee certain things. Um, so it doesn't guarantee your success, yeah? Um, all right. Then, one more thing. Is this reliable? Who put these here? Did you just find it on the internet? Did somebody else put it here? Did you put it here? You are probably going to put it here. If you are the first time entrepreneur, you are going to put your competitors. How accurate was that information? Are you sure? Well, those are little things that you may need to take a look at uh, when you answer your questions. Um, now, as you can see here, we're also coming on to product orientation and marketing orientation. Yeah. Um, Rather, product orientation or market orientation, as the words are on your textbook, you can take it that way as well. Product orientation, as I put here, you guys know what this is? Who knows what this is? So it's that new car? Uh, Cybertruck. Cybertruck, yeah. So you know, this Cybertruck was ridiculed. People made fun of it. People are like, this is like my childhood drawing where I couldn't draw curves and stuff. I just drew it. I just drew it like this. Yeah. This was made fun of. Yeah. But why is this selling so far out? Why is it selling really well? Why is it uh, doing so well in the market? Because this guy spent his time and money to um, invest in this product. I mean, uh, some of you guys have seen that Elon Musk... Um, I think in the first day, he used a massive sledgehammer and he hammered the door of the cyber truck and nothing happened, not a dent. Yeah, that's how much he spent money on uh, making this, um, well, product oriented to make sure that this is done really, really well. So in that sense, guys, when you, when you say that, uh, people will pretty much buy this product this medicine, things like that, they invest in the product rather than investing in what consumer wants. If you ask me what consumer wants, it's definitely not this. If you go take a look at the market trends, what do the Jeeps look like? Land Rover, Range Rover, Prado, all have a particular shape like this and it's all curvy or box model. This thing is a weird looking thing, yeah? But it's selling, yeah? So if this can sell, product orientation is a very viable strategy. Why care about what consumers want? You just believe in your product and sell it. Yeah, just like the iPhone. I mean, you could argue that the iPhone is also product oriented as opposed to market oriented. Now I left that blank. This market oriented, you can fit almost anything into this. Loads of the product uh, products are market oriented. They pretty much find out what consumers want. But here's your question. How is this gonna appear as a question? They're gonna give you a case study. Maybe they can give this and they'll ask, is this product oriented or market oriented? Now you need to say, yes, it is product oriented. Yes, it is market oriented as well. Find some information to say both and then conclude it to say what you think. So if you don't know how to find out product or market, just think, am I taking into consideration consumers? One of the case studies gave video games. Yeah, video games. Now video games, they said, look, it's product oriented. 
Why? Because they make the game and only then they release it to customers. They don't release it uh, before that. They, they focus on that. Product related. However, this video game was also once it's done, you know, they run a, a beta testing on that to check, uh, check the game, check the bugs and all that. So if they're running a testing with some consumers and stuff, then that's market oriented. So you need to argue this seems like it's product oriented. This seems like it's market oriented. You need to see um, which is which. And then in the final conclusion, either you can give a combination of both or you could say, you know, uh, well, I think it's more this than it is that. So that's how you answer that question. Um, it has a lot of advantages and disadvantages. See, when you when you product, when you're product oriented guys, um, Elon Musk can focus on developing that product. Yeah, focus on uh, making the product better and better and better. He can apply all kinds of techniques and whatnot because he doesn't need to keep changing. He's pushing for quality. He's pushing to better the product. And because he's focusing on only one thing without constant changes, you know what's going to happen? He's going to gain economies of scale because one thing and no customization. Yeah. Um, but market orientation, well, you keep changing it to customer needs. So obviously, if the taste and fashion is there, you keep going with that. And you're bound to get higher sales, guys. Yeah, because you're giving exactly what the customer wants. Um, and needs, wants, keep changing. We just learned a few chapters ago, dynamic markets. So if you don't do your market research and adapt your product, you can't sell it. Yeah. Um, and well, you are using effective market research. So guys, you know that these are the things. I'll give you someone who failed. I'll give you someone who was product orientation and who failed. Blackberry. Blackberry said, we believe in our product, Blackberry OS. This is what's best. We know no one can tell us. Don't tell us to change to Android. So was Nokia, no? Product oriented. They said, no, we have the best phone in the world, best selling phone in the world. But what happened? Did they follow? Did they adapt? No, they died. Where are they today? Where's Blackberry? Where's Nokia? Dead. Yeah, they're hanging on by a thread, all right. But look at all those other phones that came with market orientation and switched to Android. Not everybody's Elon Musk, okay? Sometimes you'll need to adapt it. Though I must say, guys, loads of cost because you're, you're gonna check all these things and ask consumers and do research and whatnot. And if you keep asking consumers and they keep changing, what's gonna happen? Is your future predictable? You're gonna keep changing your product. And you know the worst part? You might even abandon the old product. You might get rid of it. You'd be like, oh, well, consumer doesn't want it, so I'll get rid of it. So then comes a problem. Yeah, major problem. So as you can see, guys, product or market, both sides have its goods and bads. Yeah, so try to uh, pick one and go with one. Yeah, sometimes um, we go a lot with product orientation. Yeah, not always market oriented. We don't really do too much market orientation, more product orientation. So we do it uh, the way we think is right for you guys, and that's how we do it workshops, whatnot, whatever we do, we do it the way we think it's right. We don't go and ask you what you want, yeah? We give you because we know what we're doing. We're good at what we're doing. We research, we focus on the product, we focus on your exams, we focus on the breakdowns, and then we give it to you. As opposed to us, you know, what would you like? How would you like it? No, we don't, we don't really do that, yeah? So you can't say that either one will not be successful. Highly likely that both can be successful as well. Market segmentation. Now, market segmentation is breaking down the market. You can break down the market as far as you want, but here are some general four characteristics that you can take a look at. Geographic by location. Demographic by the structure of the population. Psychographic by uh, the way people uh, believe uh, their beliefs and things. And of course, well, behavioral, the patterns of behavior of consumers. Uh, you can see all that. I'm not gonna go through each one of them. You can take a look at all of those things, guys, and see uh, some of those things how we've managed to categorize it in our, uh, how we've managed to categorize it, yeah? So come back onto the other section, you see market segmentation, you have the advantages and disadvantages. Now, um, when you segment the market, when you divide it up, okay, we have these people here and these people here and these young people, old people, um, male, female, um, anything we can divide it based on location. So now we say, focus on them. We focus particularly on them, yeah. So you are providing everything they want. You're very effective in your communication because you're very focused on them. The response rate, 
tendency is going to be really high. People are going to be loyal. People are going to come back. It, it's very personalized. I mean, you say personalized, people like it. No? People don't like when it's a very generic thing. Yeah. Now, um, if, if you if you very particularly cater to somebody, guys, they feel special. You will see this a little later down the line. But imagine if someone says, um, um, hi, Adil, this is what you uh, need to look at. Uh, instead of saying, hi, all, uh, can you take a look at this? It feels very generic. Sometimes you might even ignore that message as opposed to us addressing you individually. That kind of brings a bit of uh, satisfaction to you. Yeah. So keep that in mind, the segmentation. But of course, when you segment it, guys, you're dividing it up into every particular area. It's going to be expensive. Yeah, it's going to be expensive to set up. You can do a load of market research to divide them up, see what exactly they want. They're not the easiest strategy to take. But of course, a very viable one nonetheless. Um, product differentiation, guys. These are some points that you could uh, go through. Product differentiation. You can differentiate your product in loads of different ways, guys. Features, packaging, um, advertising, sales, uh, discounts. You know, you differentiate your product to say, okay, we are different. Have a unique selling point. Have something. Even customer service is a product differentiation. I'll give you a good product differentiation point that is needed by everyone today. Nobody so far as I know, nobody has same day delivery. In this pandemic, in, in this situation, not one person has same day delivery. Imagine you go out there and you say same day delivery. How many customers do you think you gain? Simple, one simple aspect of product differentiation. Yeah, you need to have loads of bike riders and all that, but imagine the customer base that's going to come to you by that one point of differentiation. Then and there you get your goods. Yeah, huge benefit, yeah. Uh, not just that, same day delivery, charge them. They'll pay for it. People pay the price to get their goods, yeah. Uh, you'll build loyalty, yeah. You'll gain a competitive advantage, all those kind of benefits when it comes to product differentiation. To keep that in mind, guys, it's always useful to differentiate your products from your competitors. And then it comes down to adding value. Now, when you add value, you are giving something additional to the customers to make them feel a little more loyal. Yeah. Keep adding value to what you have. Yeah. Change your ways, add some features, give some good customer service, build a brand, have a USB. All these are technically product differentiation, but it's all added value to the customer. Yeah. So loads of little things that you can take a look at that will be very helpful for you, especially when you answer your papers, because all this you can use together. All of these things you can use together, guys. It's all coming to one question. Um, we're done with that chapter, guys. We're actually going on to the market. Slight little typo there. Now, the market is made of demand and supply, technically. Demand, supply. As you can see, curve number one, there's a movement. It's moving from this point to this point. Curve number two, or diagram number two, there's a shift. At the same price, price didn't change. More people are buying it for some reason or the other. In this case, more people are buying it. Yes, but price changed. So price changed and more people buy it here. Well, straight up, more people buy it even though price didn't change. So let's go analyze. So sometimes there are more people, immigration, more people came into the country or more population, whatever. More people moved into Colombo. Their incomes increased. Changes in the prices of substitutes. Coke charges a higher price, so Pepsi gets more business. Or compliments, cars and petrols. You guys know, uh, you guys know cars at the moment, they're going crazy. The market for cars is absolutely nuts. The car I bought a few years ago for 3 million is selling for 7, 8 million. Yeah. So obviously, when car prices are going up, no one wants petrol. Yeah. Demand is affected. You advertise something really well, you can get more demand. Tastes and fashion, certain trends uplift demand. Like if you see uh, the fidget spinner, today it's highly in demand, tomorrow it's dead. Yeah, so trends can affect your demand. Expectations, typical you guys. What happens when they announce a lockdown? Everybody ran around like headless chickens, try to go find food. 
yeah try to go find uh, buy stock up buy out the whole uh, supermarket shelves and all of them you did that right i'm sure some of you did so price didn't change but because of expectations or something you guys went and increased demand for the supermarkets for no reason there was no shortage whatsoever and of course well seasonal demand you know like christmas trees will go up in demand during christmas and sometimes external shocks yeah competition covid environmental changes government regulations sudden external shocks like even a flood can affect yeah certain things can affect your demand guys yeah they have it then you get supply same scenario here here only cause you change your price your price went up the supply goes up yeah here you did not change but more people started to supply why productivity maybe they started to produce more with the same goods indirect taxes well it's a disincentive guys why because you cannot raise your price all that much because well you're afraid they will leave sometimes you need to absorb certain a portion of the price so if you have to absorb a portion of the price a portion of the tax instead of raising your price well it's kind of disincentivizing you be like you know what i don't want to supply number of firms the more number of firms the more supply there is technology this is a given the moment you implement technology you can force a lot more um then you have subsidies you have uh cost of production so subsidies you know what these are these are like government grants that they give you and the farmer can now increase their production because of this cost of production the moment cost of production goes up people just don't want to supply they're like you know what i don't want to it's too costly my profit margins are low exchange rates can also affect you why because when the exchange rate depreciate like sri lanka is depreciating further and further and further so what happens as a result imports become expensive and expensive and expensive now how is it affecting our supply half of our goods that we make is all the raw materials are all imported so if these raw materials are imported and cost of production is rising we won't increase supply we'll just be like you know what that's that uh, i don't want it it's, uh, the profit is not there yeah weather conditions will particularly affect agriculture and again external shocks like pandemics and government regulations and what not um guys i'm sorry i'm not answering your questions on the chat can you note them down so that i can answer them towards the end so i will revisit the slides when you know make note of the slide so then i can i'll come back to the slide and i'll answer your question but note it down so we can discuss this towards the end otherwise it'll take some time if you go back and forth at this point um market equilibrium this is a given guys you know excess demand and excess supply when the price is not in equilibrium when it's disequilibrium there will be excess demand or excess supply uh in this case this is excess supply this is excess demand so as you can see the perfect equilibrium is at this price nothing far to it your curves can shift either way and it might move the prices might change but that's about it it's a small topic price elasticity of demand now when it comes to price elasticity of demand guys i'm not going to go too much in detail i'm just going to go and brief you on these particular areas and then i'll take you out um it's your responsiveness to quantity demanded to a change in price in simple terms i'm going to cut this word and i'm going to say reaction so when i say reaction guys and who's reaction quantity demanded who demands customers so the reaction of my customers when the price changes so how does my customer react when i change the price so let's say i raise the price will all my customers leave me will a few leave me will nobody leave me we need to figure it out how how what's the degree of our price elasticity of demand we need to figure out so that we can go change our price and here you can see the equation percentage change in quantity demanded or percentage change in price how you calculate this is simple guys new minus old over old each one of this new minus old divided by old into 100 same thing here new minus old over old into 100 you can get that um you have the values guys now the two most important values is inelastic and elastic others are not all that important for business studies not all that important yeah so thing that you need to remember inelastic less than 1 elastic more than 1 simple as that yeah exactly one is unitary 
perfectly inelastic is zero, perfectly elastic is infinity. Um, things that you need to keep in mind, how and what makes me inelastic? So inelastic is a good something like a cigarette. Yeah, something that you can, you can raise your prices and very few people leave you. People still continue to buy. So when people still continue to buy, well, you need to figure out how can I get the, what made me a product like that? So let's go figure it out. Factors affecting PED. Rice, you're a necessity. Cigarettes, you're addictive. Airlines, airlines, they know they're playing with urgency. You and I are flying abroad. If you purchase the ticket today and I purchase the ticket closer towards the date of flight, date of the flight, I'll pay the higher price because they realize I'm urgent. If I wasn't urgent, I'll fly next month. I have an urgency, so they raise the price. So they know that they can play with this. Peak and off peak, guys, sometimes rail travel, not in Sri Lanka, but in other countries, you have uh, during the office hours and school hours, well, the rates are higher as opposed to the rates during um, other times like 10 a.m., 11 a.m., no one travels by in, uh, on the train, yeah? So that's off peak. Um, I think you have this in dialog and SLT and all those data packages, uh, peak and off peak, nighttime data, daytime, anytime data, all of the, whatever they call it, yeah? And of course, proportion of your income spent. Guys, if you were something that's really, really, really small in income, I mean, this chit chat, I mean, the last I remember it was five rupees. I don't know if they changed their price. But even if they make a 20% change in price, 20% is huge. Technically, the 20% is six rupees. Yeah. 10% is 50 cents. What? 20% is one rupee. So if they raise their price by 20%, do you care? Does it affect your wallet? What can you even do with an additional one rupee? He says, you don't care. You just say, you know what? Yeah. If it's a good that has a low proportion of income spent, well, you're probably going to be inelastic. You don't look at the price of a chin chat, no, guys. You just take it and dump it in your cart. And of course, branding. Now, Rolex, uh, very inelastic brand. Where if they increase their prices from 1 million to 2 million, people will still buy it. Yeah, people still buy it. They can increase by 100% by a million and they'll still buy it. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you need to know in this area is the effect that it causes on total revenue. Now, when it comes to total revenue, if you're in, in short, pay attention to what I'm writing. You can refer to slides later. If it's inelastic, guys, raise your price. Just raise your price. Don't worry about it. Close your eyes and raise your price because you know only a few people will leave. That way, what will happen to your total revenue? It will rise. Yeah. If it is elastic, drop your price. Yeah. Because you know there's loads of competitors and everybody will start coming to you. You'll gain the quantity. You'll go on volume. You go on volume, your total revenue will rise. Yeah. So you can go through this and see what will happen uh, during your own time. I will share all this with you. And of course, you have YED, responsiveness of quantity demanded to a change in income, income elasticity of demand. Yeah. Again, let's simply change this reaction. Customers. How will customers react? How will customers react? when their income changes. Now, you got to be careful here. You have control over price. You don't have control over their income. So you need to see how they will react. Here, this sign plays a very important role. Whether you get a positive answer or negative answer plays a massive role here in determining certain things. Yeah. If, for example, now we're analyzing two, scenario, two uh, variants here, or rather two... Uh, items here, sorry, one is quantity demanded, which is this one, and the other one is income, yeah? You're analyzing two things. So pay focus on the color of the arrows, okay? Red arrow, when income goes up, quantity demanded goes up. This shows a positive relationship, guys. Simple basic mathematics, no? Plus into pluses. Plus, yeah. So when both goes up, shows a positive relationship. Yeah. When it is positive, guys, it can either be a normal good or inferior good. A normal good will be inelastic. In other words, it'll be below one. An elastic good will be above one, which is a luxury. 
restaurants. Restaurants can be divided both into normal restaurants and luxury restaurants as well. Your little pilaus or the things on your uh, roadside, or it can be the Shangri-Las or whatnot. Yeah, but they're all a positive um, thing. But look at the black arrow. It's still going to be positive. Down, income goes down, demand goes down. What kind of products are these? Same thing, normal or luxury. Again, minus into minus, basic maths, minus into minus is still plus. Yeah, because both going down in the same way. So long as your arrows are going in the same direction, look at which direction it's going in. It's going in the same direction, it's going to be positive. If it goes in inverse directions, it's a negative answer. So in this case, income going up, but demand going down, opposite. Yeah, or look at it the other way, income goes down, demand goes up. What kind of goods are these? When your income goes down, you'll travel more on the bus. You don't have the money. The moment your income goes up, no way, you're not going on the bus. You get a took. Why should you, you know, go on the bus and, you know, uh, wait for the bus and, you know, packed up bus. Why, why, why? Yeah. So all depends on your income. This is called an inferior good. Um, the direction the arrows play a very specific role in this. So there you have it. We got that also out of the way. Um, now, we're done with that particular area, guys. We're moving on to the next area, which is marketing mix and strategy. Now, when it comes to marketing mix and strategy, um, you're looking at a few models, okay? And in this case, this model is the PLC, Product Life Cycle. Look carefully at this cycle. You can see I've given some characteristics under each. Initially, the introduction, which is where it's taking off. Then you can see, look, look, look. Um, it, it's kind of slow. Sales are kind of slow. But then it takes off. Then it starts to curve out and then it falls, it goes dead, yeah. So you can see the characteristics here. Here, the sales are low, costs are probably a little high, yeah. Only the innovative customers will try it out here. Other guys won't try it, yeah. For example, uh, what when can we give? The vaccines. Initially, when the vaccine came out, very first vaccine, what did we do? I don't know about you, but I'd be like, uh, well, uh, you get it first and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see after that. If you're still alive, I'll, I'll, I'll go for the vaccine. Yeah. So as you can see, the innovative ones, just be like, I'm going to go get the vaccine. Yeah. There are the innovative ones. They will go ahead. I will wait until to see, okay, the vaccine didn't do anything to you. You're still alive. Not, no problem. Then I'll go. Yeah. So as you can see, two different types of customers will buy it. Now, when they realize everything is well and settling in and all of that, now they can buy. Yeah, the growth starts kicking in. Profits will rise, sales will rise, cost of customers will fall, but a lot of competitors will come in as well. At this point, you're making the maximum sales, peak sales, nothing more than this. Cost per, cost, cost per customer will fall. Profits will be higher. It's a mass market. And well, competitors will be very stable here. And then you'll get it. Uh, it's evening out, guys. It's coming towards the end of its life. It's not yet, it's coming towards it. And of course now, falling sales, cost per customer is still low. Profits are falling. Yeah, customer base is reducing. You know, it's going down, it's going down, it's going down. If I were to ask you, or if I were to tell you rather, where do you advertise the most? There are only two stages that you advertise the most, throwing loads of ads. One is when you launch it, one is when it's dying, yeah? As you can see, guys, Coke is advertising like crazy. If you guys don't know, Coke's advertising budget, I think it's $4 billion. If you guys can see my screen. $4 billion a year. $4 billion. Why is Coke spending so much on advertising? Why? Its product is dying. And if the product is dying, well, you need to try to keep pushing it. And the only way you can keep pushing it is by trying to push more and more and more Advertising, simple as that. Going back, um, so you advertise a lot here, advertise a lot here. Here you're picking up your study, you have no problems. Yeah. Um, one other little, we'll continue product life cycle on the next slide. But one other little topic that I wanted to take you through is marketing objectives. The marketing team has three objectives mainly. One, build a brand. 
Two, increase the market share. And three, generate more revenue. Keep generating revenue, revenue, revenue. So these are your three marketing objectives, something isolated to this. But we'll now go back to product life cycle. This is extracted off a question from your past paper. Now, when you extract this off your past papers, guys, uh, you can see how useful it is. So we'll take a look at this, okay? Firstly, how can we extend it before it dies? Can we extend it? Now it's going down. Before it can die, can we extend it? Can we extend it? Can we extend it? Yeah. Easy way, cut down your price. People will still buy. Find new users, USES. What can you do? What are the new users that you can find? Yeah. Um, what are some good products that found new users? Um, Coke. Now, not so much, but Coke back in the day was a medical drink. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you another example, which is, um, what is it? What is it? What is it? You can take even ginger beer. Yeah. Back in the day, guys, people bought ginger beer. They'd be like, oh, if you have a stomachache, go buy ginger beer. Yeah, ask your parents or grandparents, they'll tell you that. Ginger beer was meant for those kind of things. I mean, it, it was a drink, but that was a perception around it. That is why ginger beer came up with a rad raving campaign, guys. It came up with, what is that? As they say in singular, EGB network, camera pa. No EGB, no food. Yeah. So as you can see, they found new uses to make it a very hip product so that people have it with a kotu or something like that. Yeah. New uses, or even you could say uh, Johnson & Johnson. Yeah. Johnson & Johnson uh, had baby... I can't remember if it's Johnson Johnson, but some product had baby creams. They found a new use immediately. What did they say? For mother and baby. Now you have two users, not one. Now mother uses it, baby uses it. Both. Yeah. So these are extension strategies. Modify your product, change it a bit. Yeah. As you can see, this is typical in the car market, guys. Take your uh, vessel or whatever. Vessel, you have 2014. Vessel, you have 2015. Vessel, you have 2016. And so on and so forth. And what's the difference? Some little fog light changes, slight change in the buffer. Yeah. One extra speaker inside your car, something or the other. I mean, leather seat. There's no real change. It's the same damn thing. They're just putting a little makeup on it and selling it back to you again. And you, oh, 2018 model, I must buy it. It's fooled you. Well, you're the fool at the end of the day, but they made it. They modified the product. Well, advertise, push your advertising, ramp up your advertising, just like I told you for Coke, and maybe export it. Find a new market, guys. Maybe someone buy. Yeah. This one is part of the question, guys, that came out of our past paper. So here you say, look, the product life cycle. You can decide your proper promotional strategies. What do you need to do? Should you advertise here or here or whatever? Shows when you should use the extension strategies, shows what products can be discontinued. Yeah. But the drawbacks, well, these are some common points that you can use. Too simplistic a model. There's nothing much given here, no? Doesn't take into account any competitors or whatnot. Yeah. Conclude it by saying, look, well, you need other information and research to make it foolproof. Yeah. So some things like that. Product life cycle. Done, dusted, out of the way. Now you have what we call the Boston matrix. Boston matrix made up of two uh, axes, four quadrants. Um, now, two axes, market share, market growth. When it comes to market share, um, what is your slice of the cake? High or low? Market growth, is the cake becoming bigger? This is your slice of the cake. Are you increasing your slice of the cake or not? But the market growth is about, is the cake becoming bigger? Is the market becoming bigger? Yeah. Now, if you have a high and high, high and high, high market growth, high market share, you call the star. Yeah. They're doing well, great opportunities. Best thing you should do, invest. The strategy you should take, invest. Low and low, dogs, divest. It's weak, difficult opposite of invest is divest. 
let it go guys some people don't know when to give up sometimes you should just realize look it's time to give up blackberry is dying nobody wants a blackberry they're still making a phone this year i'm sure none of you will even bat an eye towards the blackberry phones they're still trying sometimes guys you got to realize okay we're dead let it go divest your product divest the blackberry maybe because blackberry has other branches as well and of course well cash cow this is because this is the payload guys this is the payload when i say this is a payload this is something like coke i'll explain why your market share is really high coke has a huge market share but the market growth is low market growth is low so if the market growth market is not good people don't want fizzy drinks people are going to all these healthy stuff if i were to ask you when you guys picked up a coke last i don't think you drink it as frequent as you drank it 2 3 4 years ago yeah i used to have coke on a daily basis i don't know when i had coke last but when the market is dying off or it's it's lowering off milk your strategy is milk when i say milk i mean milk the cow milk the cow before the cow dies get as much as you can from the cow as far as you can cash cow it's the payload yeah and then finally you get your question mark guys now the question mark there's a reason why we call it a question mark this is well we don't know what's happening something is wrong the market is growing electric cars are growing really well yeah smart phones are growing really well yeah but certain things are not growing like how would you call it um the nissan leaf it's stuck go on to ikman and check the price of nissan leaf is dirt cheap it's cheaper than an alto yeah it's not selling something is wrong your market share is low or blackberry smartphone market is the peak market now market growth market share really low massive question mark now here what is your strategy when you are at a question mark you don't know what to do you don't know what to do with the question mark you either decide shall we invest and try to take it to a star that is why blackberry is still trying or shall we kill it and just turn it into a dog decide which strategy you are going with here you have to decide here you invest here you divest here you milk yeah so that's your model for you but when it comes to the usefulness guys um well this is how the question came in you can identify which product should be invested in you can take necessary decisions like to discontinue a dog yeah um you can help recognize which stage your product is in therefore you can plan the promotional strategies accordingly yeah though though it's a snapshot in time yeah the the last time that fidget spinner thingy or whatever yeah that was here before you know it you blink of an eye and then it's gone to a dog it's a snapshot in time today it's here tomorrow it's there yeah um well not all dogs should be discontinued sometimes keep it guys sometimes it's because of pandemic or something something has caused something wrong with it keep it it may be generating some form of revenue something at least so don't discontinue just discontinue everything and well it doesn't take into account external factors it's only take into account these two things and of course well the conclusion you need to say this is insufficient a model alone use it alongside the uh, product life cycle use it alongside market research then you'd be able to make a full proof system so some generic disadvantages there so that is the boss matrix something else here this section is generally overlooked by a lot of people but i need you to study this there's something called outbound marketing and inbound marketing if you never heard of it it's there on your book you can go take a look there's something called outbound there's something called inbound there's something called hybrid yeah when it comes to hybrid you're mixing both let's discuss first what is inbound and what is outbound when it comes to inbound marketing strategies you're trying to it's kind of a pull factor you're pulling something in your consumer driven yeah um easy example 
yeah you are looking for help with okay you guys are going on to youtube because you need help with price elasticity of demand yeah you need help with price elasticity of demands because you don't know so you're going on youtube in hope that someone's done a video there for you to take a look excuse my internet i live in sri lanka so i have to put up with this terrible internet for now but uh the moment it loads we can take a look at an example let's assume you went to take on take a look at um ped some help because you didn't understand what the concept was what these things were you find a video you find a video and that person who put the video knows that you are looking for a problem no you don't go look for uh, ped you know let's say we're going to look at subsidies a question you don't go look at um, how would you call it you know that people don't come and look at ped for the fun of it no guys people come and look at ped because they are looking for help with an exam yeah so if that's the case at the end of the video at the end of the video after if they like it and learn something out of it put a massive banner there jd education join our classes yeah that's inbound marketing why is it inbound marketing because somebody is looking for something and you went and reeled him in yeah you went and reeled him in because mind maps a little reminder to all of you um you went and reeled him in because he was looking for something and you took him in from that yeah as opposed to as opposed to um going and randomly throwing things so we're going to see what we mean by randomly throwing things at the customer um back to our slide let's go look at outbound marketing cast your net hopefully someone comes to you yeah cast your net and hope someone comes to you yeah so simply put uh the guys here are you waiting for are you going to approach that girl who's looking at you across the room and then you're going to approach her Or are you going to wear a sign on your shirt saying "I'm single" and uh, wait for somebody to come to you? Yeah, there's no saying. I mean, who's to say? Someone might see your sign on the T-shirt and say, "Oh yeah, I'm single. Okay, come to you." What do you want to do? Are you going for that person who's looking at you, or are you going for the? Are you just trying your luck with everybody? Okay. Now it naturally makes sense to go to the person here, like the person who's looking for your product, and not for your product, for for a problem that she has a he or she has a problem, and you want to go fix it. So go and take a look at that. Yeah, see how you can um, give a solution to that. Now naturally, that seems the most ideal one. So we can easily, if someone goes looking for PD, I can easily get that person and bring him in here. Outbound, on the other hand, guys, I mean, come on. uh chances of it succeeding i mean i'll show you outbound i'll show you outbound if my internet loads up um outbound if i'm sure none of you have clicked on this promotion tab ever yeah and if nobody's clicked on this
I'm back. I'm sorry. Slight technical errors. Um, let's get back to where we were, guys. Now, I was talking to you about outbound marketing. When it comes to outbound marketing, guys, we have a few things that we need to take a look at. Yeah. Now, I was showing you outbound marketing. I'm sure you guys have a Gmail account. And I don't know if any of you have ever clicked on this promotion tab. Yeah. Um, these are all promotions. They are just trying their luck. Maybe, maybe I might click it. Oh, 50% off Uber. That looks kind of nice. Oh, actually, yeah, pretty good a deal. Who's to say, what if I just, now look at it, I just clicked on it. I actually might use this code today, unless some of you are steal the code, but I actually might use the code today. Yeah, why? Because I simply know that, well, uh, I'm getting something good, but they just cast their net hoping some fish will get hooked to it. That is outbound marketing, guys. Yeah, so, but the thing, guys, that you need to know about outbound and inbound is that outbound is faster. Recording in progress. Outbound is faster. Inbound is slower. When I say outbound is faster, guys, I mean to say that um, chances are that somebody might look at it just like I saw that Uber thing. Now, just because you saw my video on YouTube, doesn't mean you're going to ring me up the very next day and say, I'm joining Jade. You're not going to do that. It might take some time. It might take a few more uh, days. It might take uh, a few more videos and only then you'll join. Inbound is slow. Outbound is fast. Even though this is because here you're trying 1 million people. Here you're not trying 1 million. It's just maybe you're trying about uh, 100 people. Yeah. These chances of these 100 people coming in very likely, but out of the 1 million, you're saying that even 10 people or 20 people won't come in? Sometimes, guys, you got to go with a combination of both. And the combination of both is called hybrid. Yeah, a hybrid strategy. So a hybrid strategy, guys, that is something that you could use to um, drive your marketing campaigns. Um, customer loyalty, pretty straightforward, guys. You know what this is. How do you develop customer loyalty? Obviously, customer service, yeah? Give good customer service. They will stay with you. Incentives, give some incentive for them to buy. Like that Uber gave me 50% off or rewards me if I, uh, now Uber has a reward scheme. They said, if you buy so much, you get 300 rupees off after the third order or something like that, yeah? Personalize it, personalize it, yeah? Put in, ad address them by name, yeah? Talk to them, I told you this before. Talk, call them by name, be like, uh, you know, Adil, uh, how would you like to come in uh, on this day? We have certain offers here. They kind of feel like, okay, well, naturally, they feel really good, yeah? Or send them a birthday card. I get birthday cards from loads of places. My banks, my, uh, my credit cards, I got loads of credit cards, guys. My banks, Every birthday, I get three or four cakes. Yeah, they like uh, happy birthday. You know, uh, listen, of course, all this platinum stuff. So all these things, they because if you are like high end customers, they keep sending it to you. But kind of feels nice, no? Yeah. Or preferential treatment like Club Vision, like VIP memberships, VIP lounge. Yeah. I I have. I have a priority pass. Yeah. This priority pass gives me access to any business class lounge in the world. Uh, I think it's almost any or 600 plus business class lounges in the world. Yeah. Um, even if I don't pay for business class, I will be given this priority. Yeah. So this priority pass is pretty cool. No, I got this from one of my credit cards and I kind of feel VIP right now. I'm kind of loyal to that credit card. I mean, I feel so good that they treated me well and gave me this. Yeah, I feel I feel really good. So 
that's a way to keep customers happy. Yeah. Um, and communication, guys, keep communicating to your customers, keep telling them what is necessary, tell them your new products, your launches, tell them the updates, tell them what they're doing, you know, it, it, it keeps them satisfied. Yeah. All right, now we're done with those areas, guys. We're gonna go straight into product price, place and promotion, but I'm gonna do a very holistic approach. This is huge, but I'm not gonna go in detail. I'm only gonna go in a very holistic approach. Yeah, so let's take a look. I put product price, place, promotion all in one slide. Yeah, under product guys, you had design mix. If you remember that you had aesthetics, economic manufacture and function. Make sure the product looks and feels good. Make sure it's cost uh, cost effective to produce, and make sure it serves a purpose. No, one of the case studies came with the Galaxy Note Seven. The Note Seven didn't serve the purpose; it just exploded. So you need to have these three things in your products. Not that you have to have all three; you can have a combination of a few. But yeah, if you want to have a successful product, you go according to design mix. The trend nowadays, guys, the trend nowadays, people want something, recyclable stuff, reusable stuff, waste minimization, reusable stuff like um, a glass bottle. Yeah, they can give it to you in a glass bottle. And when it's over, like you can buy those, uh, I think American Water has a glass bottle or Olu, I think that was a the brand. They have a glass bottle of water. You can drink the water and reuse it for something else is reusable, recyclable. Um, put it in a way that can be used for something else. I mean, crushed and used later or something like that, like uh, the Coke cans. Yeah, those cans can be crushed and they collect it back and they can convert it into cans all over again. And of course, waste minimization. I'll show you something that really happened. Um, back in the day, none of the phones had a charger like this. This charger can be used as a charger or a data cable right there. Back in the day, we had a separate data cable and we had a separate charger. Now, this was one of the biggest waste minimization strategies. Look at this. Such convenience, how much less uh, wire is needed. Yeah, this is what consumers want. They don't want you to, uh, you know, pollute the planet and whatnot. And of course, well, ethical sourcing. When it says ethical sourcing, get it from ethical suppliers. If you don't, you're going to have loads of problems when it comes to, um, you know, selling your products. People won't like it. People don't support these unethical businesses. When it comes to price, guys, you have so many different types of pricing. You have um, competitive pricing. You have psychological, predatory, skimming, penetration, cost plus. You should know this. If you don't know this, you'll need to go through each one of them. I'm not going to spend too much time on what this is. I'll just give you a brief. Pricing it alongside the competitors. Uh, this is kind of like psychological where they kind of not rounded off to the end, like 499, 599. Predatory, lowering your price, maybe even below cost to drive out your competitors. Yeah, existing ones. Skimming, charge a higher price at the start and slowly lower it down like technology industries. Penetration, the opposite, charge a lower price at the start and then go increase it like the restaurant years. These people charge... Uh, uh, lower prices to lower you in and then charge high prices after that. And cost plus, check a look at your cost and at a markup and price. Social trends, guys, there's dynamic pricing. People nowadays tend to change their prices always. They, 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 uh, it's very dynamic. Prices can change. Yeah. Auctioning, like eBay, you can buy things on auction. Personalized pricing, you give a price particular to that particular person. Price comparison sites is now something, a new trend that has come on board. So you're trying to price it accordingly, according to price comparison sites. You guys know Trivago, Booking.com. All of those are price comparison sites. Yeah. And of course, subscription pricing. This is the latest trend. Yeah. Everything is going to subscription. Earlier, you used to buy a movie. Now you don't buy a movie. You pay subscription for Netflix. Uh, earlier, we used to buy Adobe Photoshop and things like that. Now you can't buy it. You pay subscription. You pay per month. Yeah, people are switching to subscription pricing because it's a lot more money and it's more affordable. No, the Adobe software, when I used to buy it back in the day, 500 US dollars, 500 US dollars. I can't afford 500 US dollars straight up. Yeah, that's 100,000 rupees. Yeah, 
Now, if they send me, tell me 20 US dollars a month, eh, that's okay. 20 US dollars is how much? 4,000 rupees. Yeah, that's affordable as opposed to 100,000. But trick is 4,000 rupees I'm paying forever. There I paid $500 at once. But then, you know, people's wallet is friendly on the wallet, guys, so it's easy for them as well. That is your social transfer pricing. Place, well, you have two stage, you got three stage, and you got four stage. Now, this is things when it comes to place. Um, also, you will need to know the different types of retailers like kiosks, you'll need to know um, market traders, you need to know supermarkets, hypermarkets, all of those uh, multiples, little note on your book that you can take a look at, you need to know what those are. And of course, well, even for place we have a social trend today, what is that? Well, online distribution, that's the main one. Yeah. And you're dividing the online distribution is B2B and B2C as well. Not only in online, you can even divide it at all in general as B2B and B2C. Business to business, like certain things you supply to businesses. Certain things you supply to um, consumers. B2B is like machinery. B2C is like, well, food. Yeah. And the latest trend, products are becoming services. How? Music CDs, Apple Music became a service, no longer a physical product. DVDs, Netflix. Um, newspapers, the newspaper channel or Facebook, or Instagram or whatever, you can read it online or the app or whatever, yeah? Everything is becoming a service. Yeah, it, it's just becoming a service. Now, promotion, the final P. You have something called ATL and BTL, above the line and below the line. Yeah, when it comes to ATL and BTL, ATL is mainstream advertisements, billboards, social media, radio, newspaper, TV, those things. Anything and that's advertising, yes. BTL below the line, non-advertising, branding, loyalty cards, giveaways, buy one, get one free, donations, sponsorships, any of them. Yeah. When it comes to advertising, there are three. Persuasive, you're persuading someone to come and buy it from you. Informative, just giving out information about the product, not really trying to drag the people in. Reassuring, guys. This is the type of advertisement that is least done in Sri Lanka. Put out an ad to say, congratulations, uh, you have just purchased the best product. You got it at the best price. Don't you think the customer will be uh, very much more happy? Yeah. Don't you think customers will be a lot more happy? You said, okay. Um, Ananya, you got the best product. You got it at the cheapest price. Yeah, kind of makes you happy, yeah? Because you, uh, well, know that it's kind of good. Do that, do it. Even if you guys start a business, do it. That's the most important thing because they'll come back to you. They'll even go tell their friends. What happens in Sri Lanka? Advertise, persuade, take. Once you sell, don't care about the customer. Don't do that. Don't do that. Give Give them some sort of reassurance. Yeah. And of course, social trends in promotion, social media. I don't need to tell you about this. You guys know social media better than I do. Viral marketing. Now, we saw loads of ads that can go uh, viral marketing. I've showed some of you all before. You have Burger King that is specialized in its uh, viral marketing. Um, McDonald's had a trademark as Big Mac. McDonald's had the Big Mac trademark. When McDonald's had the Big Mac trademark, guys, well, they lost it. They lost the trademark. So when McDonald's lost the trademark in the UK or the EU, I think, Burger King went on with some really viral advertisement. What did they say? Like a Big Mac, but actually big. This is their menu. They changed their menu that week. Burger Big Mac wished it was. Kind of like a Big Mac, but juicier and tastier. Anything but a Big Mac. Big Mac-ish, but flame grilled, of course. Yeah. So as you can see, that people shared this and shared this and shared this and shared this and shared this until finally, you know, Burger King is championing viral marketing. These guys are like crazy good. You can go look at the advertisements. Whopper, Big Mac. Big Mac seems more like a medium. 
Yeah. As you can see, guys, these things are viral now. People share this like crazy. Yeah, people share it like crazy. So as you can see, these things work. This is the trend today. People want to see shareable material. They don't want to see the boring all buy this, buy that. No, 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 no. Viral marketing. Okay. And of course, you got emotional branding. You can brand certain things emotionally, guys. I mean, loads of the time people buy. I mean, look at them. Superstars, Ronaldo. You guys know about the recent Coke incident or Pepsi. I can't remember what it was. I think Coke, yeah. So he moved away the Coke while he had his press conference. The moment he moved away his Coke, well, $4 million loss or $4 billion loss in the market value of Coke. Yeah. Why? Why? Why did they lose? Because people were emotionally attached to a player. Yeah. So use it in your own benefit. You try to. That is why people use all the superstars and whatnot. Why? They're emotionally branding it. Yeah. People like this whole emotional brand. I mean, people are moved by this. People are attached to certain superstars and all of those things. So that you can use your own benefit. Yeah. Why do you think Virat Kohli is on all these ads? Sachin Tendulkar, uh, Ronaldo, uh, you name it, guys. Um, Shah Rukh Khan, yeah, big time, my emotional branding, yeah. Um, all right, so that's it to this promotion, price, place, and product. Now, this is just an overview, like I said, with the social trends given, just so you can understand it. Now, we're going on to a bit of branding, guys. When it comes to branding, you have certain benefits, yeah. Uh, the recognition, loyalty, credibility, confidence, you know, people are attracted to this brand, you know, loads of benefit when it comes to that. How do you do it? Develop a USP, a unique selling point, advertise, sponsor, use social media, do all you can to build a brand. You get loads of benefits. Great stuff. Marketing chapter, done. We're going on to managing people. Now, managing people is fairly large and has loads of 20 markers that have come from this before. Two things you need to know. You can treat your staff as an asset or as the cost. Now, as an asset, you're going to invest in them, give them training, give them recognition, give good leadership, give them holidays, give them, uh, treat them like king. Yeah. But then you've got the guys who don't treat them like assets, they treat them like a cost. Why do they treat them like a cost? When you say treat them as a cost, give them the minimum wage, yeah, don't invest in training, you know, just give them the bare minimum. Now, obviously, most of you will jump onto this and say, this is what we should treat staff like. No, you're not going to treat your uh, person who's coming to clean your place and all of that every day. You're not going to invest and give holidays and training and all of that person. Unskilled staff will treat them as a cost. It's only viable that you treat them as a cost instead of treating them as an asset. So. There's that that you need to take a look at. Then, um, we're moving on to flexible workforce, guys. When it comes to flexible workforce, there are several different methods. Uh, zero hour contracts, part-time, temporary staff, multi-skilling, home working, flexible hours, and work, outsourcing. Go take a look at what these are. You have to know what these are, because if you don't know, well, you are at a big drawback. This is a 20 marker right here. Yeah. Flexible workforce, guys, there are loads of advantages. Well, um, you don't have to commit a payment if you're in a zero-hour contract. It's cheaper, it's easier. Part-time is cheaper. Temporary is cheaper. You can get them to work on unsocial hours like weekends. Yeah. Multi-skilling, get one person to do multiple areas of the job. Well, cheaper, suitable for a small business. Small business, it's a one-man show. You got one person to do everything. So that's that. Home working, well, you have lost all your fixed costs. No need rent, no need electricity, all of that. And kind of motivates the employee because they get to do whatever they want at home as well, in addition to do their work. Flexible hours. Kind of motivates your employee because you tell them you can come in at this time and that time, but just make sure that your job is done at the end of the day. Productivity. Outsourcing, cheaper, and obviously the person you outsource it to may be more skilled, no? because they've been doing this on and on and on. They're solely focused on that. You're focused on so many different things. Outsource certain things to them. They might do it better. 
So the drawbacks that will come in, commitment, there's a fall in commitment when it comes to zero hours because they know they don't have a full-time job. Maybe a little more expensive if it's, if it's paid hourly. Part-time also lack of commitment. You may not be able to contact them during off hours. Yeah. Temporary staff of a lack of commitment, can't contact them, maybe more expensive. Multi-skilling, well, jack of all trades and a master of none. This is the exact opposite of specialization. No efficiency gains. Homeworking can be very distracting. Commitment may fall. It's not efficient. You can't monitor. All of those things can happen. Yeah, it is homeworking doesn't work for all businesses, especially if you're a manufacturing business. Flexible hours, difficult to monitor, may be abused. People will abuse the power. People will just come in at any time they want without even finishing their work and stuff. And of course, outsourcing, it's expensive. Um, and you're losing control of that part of the business because now they're doing it and not you. You've signed a contract that only they can do it. And the quality can fall, especially if they these outsourcing people don't really focus on the quality. So you got to be very careful when you outsource, make sure you give it to the right people. That's flexible workforce for you, a full-on 20 marker. Collective bargaining, you can go through your advantages and disadvantages. I'm going to give you a brief of what collective bargaining is. Here, you're going to bargain through a trade union leader. That way, you are bargaining collectively for wages and working conditions and whatnot, as opposed to going to them individually. Individual bargaining versus collective bargaining. This way, guys, well, it's really good that you go to a union leader and do it. Why? They listen to the union leader. So what if you what if you agree with the union leader? It's done. Yeah. And it's cost effective rather than going to each one of them. There is no favorite favoritism, nothing. Why? One for all. Yeah. And the person who is coming to meet you is selected by them. So they, they respect the guy and they'll accept his things. But the drawback, obviously, this trade union leader will have way more power than you going individually. Yeah. And negotiations will be really high. They'll bargain for a lot. And if you don't agree on this negotiation, you know what will happen? They'll go strikes. They go with strikes. Yeah. And of course, well, owners may feel that, well, this is compromise because um, their, their ownership is compromised. I mean, if, if, for example, if, for example, the trade union is dictating the terms and you're the owner paying their salary. I mean, come on, that doesn't seem fair. I'm paying your wage and you're telling me how I should do things. Why should I pay you? Yeah, so there are little things that can come in. Now, managing people. When it comes to managing people, guys, um, the next stage is recruitment. Recruitment has stages. Firstly, Come up with the two documents, which is the job description and person specification. One of this is about the job. One of this is about the person, like the qualifications and skills and the experience and things like that. Then you can advertise it either internally or externally. Here are some external methods of advertising. Shortlist the candidates that come in, interview them. You can also have some form of selection testing. It's optional, like a written test of some sort. At Jade, we have a um, demo lesson. So if you are to come in to teach at Jade, you need to go through, you'll have an interview. Then we'll have a demo lesson. Only after the demo lesson, you'll be, we'll be selecting. So that's a selection test. Then you get um, the job offer. And finally, make sure you tell the people that, well, you didn't get the job, those who didn't get it. Because otherwise, they'll be still waiting on you. Yeah, lowest of costs of recruitment, guys. Well, there's advertising cost, there's a time of the interview, there's a training cost, induction trainings, and all of that that will come. In. Yeah, so here's recruitment for you, the stages. Whole bunch of things between internal and external. Mind you, another 20 marker right here. Yeah, internal, well, cheaper, you know the person, the familiar, the fellow gets motivated because he is being promoted. Uh, you don't have to train him. Yeah. But the problem, when you get one person to fill in this one, that post gets vacant. And you fill in someone else, that post gets vacant. You're creating a chain of vacancies. Yeah. No fresh ideas coming in. No fresh blood. It's all the same old things. Same old, same old. Yeah. Um, your culture will be very narrow. You're not getting any new insights. The pool of candidates to select is really, really small. And obviously, well, 
uh, if you don't select a particular person and the other one is selected, lot, loads of jealousy and all kind of problems, no? So lot, lots of things that can happen like that. And of course, an external, well, the complete opposite, fresh ideas, larger pool, you could possibly pay them cheaper wages. Yeah, because right now the market is depressed. If I wanted to hire someone, well, I can get someone for like 20,000 and they'll come and work for me. There's enough and more people who are waiting for a job, possibly cheaper. I can't give the person inside a cheaper salary because he's already getting a certain amount of salary from back in the day. And industry knowledge, yeah. Drawbacks, well, huge harangue procedure to get someone from the outside. The person will take time to settle in. He'll need to understand the culture. You don't even know if that person is good. I mean, do you trust someone at an interview? That guy is probably lying through his nose. He's saying, I'm a hard worker. I'm this, I'm that, I'm this. You believe him? If you're an interviewer and you believe him, you're a fool to believe the person at that point. Yeah, he's going to tell everything that's, uh, he's going to bring out all the good sides. You will not know his true colors until he stays in the job for about one, two months. Yeah. And there are some negative reactions from internal guys. They'll be like, why are you taking someone from the outside? I was here for so long. I deserve to be promoted. Eh, all kind of things may come. So those are some goods and bads when it comes to internal and external recruitment. On the job, off the job, another 20 marker. Yeah. Um, people have experience. Yeah, on the job. Okay, so let me define on the job first. On the job, guys, you're getting some old person to come and train a new person or a senior employee to come and train a junior employee. That's one way. Some other methods, you can go for them. One way. So one way that you can do this is by doing that. But the be best part is, the guy has good knowledge. He's teaching you from his experience. Um, he's teaching you only the relevant stuff, not the irrelevant stuff. The output is carrying on because you're still, the worker is working and things are still happening. It's cheaper than going and sending you outside for training. And well, personal experience, it's better that you give advice from there than going and take some general MBA or some other training program outside. Drawback is that the trainer can be frustrated because you don't pay the trainer, no? You're just getting the senior guy, come train this junior guy. He's not getting paid. Yeah. Um, if the trainer feels insecure, if the trainer feels like this junior guy might take over my job someday, you know what? I am not going to do a good job. I'm just going to teach him only the bad sides. Yeah. They might pass on their bad habits, pass on the shortcuts. Yeah. Trainer's output will also fall and well, mistakes while doing the job, yeah? So when they're on the job, if you're making things on the job, you make mistakes, well, you're tarnishing the reputation of the organization. You're a newbie. You don't know, yeah? Um, off the job training, guys, well, trained by skilled experts. You're motivated because you get a certificate in the end. There's no stress from work because you're really doing the things individual. No one's calling you say, do this, do that, nothing. You're just doing that, yeah? And when you get a certificate and things like that, you probably are going to get promoted. Yeah, and you can have this out during outside work. Maybe on Saturday, Sunday, go do it on Saturday, Sunday. Drawbacks, what happens the moment you get your certificate, you get an MBA, you're going to work for the same employer. Who paid? Really? So take it away, go, go work for someone else. Get a higher pay. It's kind of costly to send a guy on an MBA. There's no output. Yeah, it's not focused on the relevant aspects. Yeah, so it's irrelevant. It's just teaching some general knowledge. Yeah. So things like that, off the job and on the job, guys, you can take a read, a few things that I highlighted for you. Then you've got tall and flat organizations, guys. When it comes to tall and flat, you have um, a, a tall structure is really one with many layers of the hierarchy, whereas a flat structure has very few layers. Now, we're not going through this individually, but just to give you a quick advantage, disadvantage scope here. Well, in a tall, Everyone has a narrow scope. They know what they're doing. There are only few employees working under them. Yeah. And there's a clear progression of guys. They know that, okay, after this person, there's this person, there's this layer, and this layer. So I can be assistant manager, manager, you know, all of that. Yeah. There's a clear chain of command. Everyone knows what's happening. Oh, all that is given. But the drawbacks, well, more layers, more cost. More layers, slower decisions. Takes time to pass down. Yeah. Um, um, sometimes you don't have the freedom to do your own things because it has to come from the top. Loads of different things when it comes to tall structure. As opposed to that, you have your flat structure. Well, 
very fast to adapt to changes. It's flat now, you can do whatever you want because everyone's doing a bit of everything. Yeah, very fast to communicate. As you can see, just two layers here. So this fellow will say, do this, and they all do it. It's very democratic because you're asking everyone, everyone's working together. You know, it feels, feels good. A lot of autonomy, a lot of motivation there. As opposed to being in the tall structure, we are only doing this particular area. But there are drawbacks in the flat structure. Why? Management has a huge workload because one manages so many staff. You don't have a close relationship with them. And everybody's a generalist. They're not a specialist. Nobody's a specialist. Why everyone's doing everything? Here, no, everyone's specializing some area. Here, no, everyone's just doing everything. Yeah. So you have some goods and bads of both that you need to take a look at. But guys, apart from this came a third structure that a lot of people ignored and it came as a question for your papers, which was matrix. Matrix structure is, well, where people, you have the different departments and a project manager and you can, two project managers or more, and each person works for both project managers. Yeah, so predictably you're getting two jobs done with one set of people, which is good. It's efficient. The leadership is very democratic because you're getting everyone to input. People are satisfied because they're doing a lot of interesting work. But there's major conflict, guys. Why? Because this guy will work for him and him. And he says, get this done by today. And he'll be like, no, this fellow asked me to get it done by today as well. I can't do both. Issues of, issues of resource allocation. You don't know how many people that you can get at what different time. Yeah, because it's working for two different people. And the individuals won't be recognized by this guy will be recognized because it's like individual. Yeah, it's like it's, it's like a team thing rather than it is an individual thing. So there's no recognition in that as well. Centralization, decentralization, here's an easy way of looking at it. Centralization is like where all the decisions are made at the top. So it's faster, it's standardized, yeah? And who has more skills? Obviously the person at the top, yeah? And better communication, because only one way we're telling, okay, this is what needs to be done, be clear and cut and correct. Decentralized, you let people down the line do it. They feel motivated, they feel pumped up. Senior managers can focus on what they have to do because the junior fellows are doing all the others. The junior fellows are really satisfied and quick the responses locally. You know, so when somebody asks you a question, you'll be like, oh, yes, sir, we can give you this discount. As opposed to saying, sir, I'll need to check with the manager and then uh, I'll let you know tomorrow. And then you go check with the manager, manager checks with his manager and then it comes back down. Centralization, that's a problem. Decentralization, if they ask you, can we have a discount? Yes, I can give you a 10% discount right now. Yeah, so quicker decisions right there. And don't you think you're grooming the next in line? Now, that person is ready to take over your job because he's been doing the same things on and on and on and you're giving him more responsibility down. He's ready to take over your job. Yeah, so you're grooming the next in line, which is really good. You're training the fellow. Um, you have motivation theories, guys. You have four different people, Mayo, Taylor, Maslow, and Herzberg. Taylor said one thing, keep this in mind. He said money. Mayo said, well, mostly non-financial, achievement, recognition, teamwork. Maslow had a hierarchy of needs. Basics, get your basics first. Your food, your shelter and things. Security, a long-term job maybe. Social needs, maybe work in a team, have some friends, belong to a part of a team at work. Esteem needs, maybe ask for a company car or a cubicle of your own or something like that. And self-actualization, when you've reached the top now, you don't really know what you want next. You know you come to the top, you come to the highest potential. Now you know you are the best form of yourself. You've evolved. Then came Herzberg. He came with two factors. Um, something important that you need to see here, guys. He said there were hygiene factors and motivators. Hygiene factors, largely financial. Motivators, largely non-financial. But be careful because he said hygiene factors, if it's not there, it will demotivate. If it's there, it will not motivate. It will just keep you satisfied up to here only. Motivators will motivate you. If it's not there, it will not demotivate. It will just will keep you satisfied. There's a large line in between. So hygiene factors is important because if you don't have it, they'll be demotivated. Motivators, well, if you don't have it, nothing will happen. But if you have it, they'll be motivated, which is a good thing to look at. Um, 
Here you have financial methods and non-financial methods, guys. So you have bonuses, piece rates, time rate, commission, and whatnot. Non-financial, you have job rotation, awards, team working, flexible working, all these things that are here that you can go through on your own time. Loads of benefits of financial. Some people are just made to, they just need finances. They want money. Yeah, especially the guys down here at the one stage, basic stage, or the guys according to FW Taylor. You can bring their theories into your questions, yeah? They want uh, certain advantages. Their advantages are like, um, well, they want the money. Yeah, you have a clear line of structure. It's all performance linked. So you can see, you can see the benefits that came out of the rewards that you gave them. Yeah, so the drawbacks guys is really expensive to go with this. And the moment, suppose you give a profit share scheme and the profits drop in the organization, all these fellows will be highly demotivated. Peace rate, you give them peace rate, these guys will keep going on and on and on and you know, they won't care about quality. Yeah. Commissions, they won't feel secure. They'll be like, if I don't sell next month, I won't have a salary. Oh, okay. So now there is a problem. So you need to think whether financial or non-financial. Non-financial, you have certain other things, well, no boredom. People feel motivated. They feel like they take pride in their job. They say, look, I did this. Yeah. Um, you are testing their leadership skills also because you're giving them certain tasks to be done, you know, job rotation, job enlargement. Drawbacks though, look, training cost, train them a lot. Yeah. Um, some people, guys, well, at the end of the day, you can't say that you're not financially motivated, no up to some point also when you get more skills and stuff, you will ask what I say, like, I want a higher pay. People want money at the end of the day. Yeah, it's not just job rotation and things. And well, if you give a lot of uh, non-financial things like um, what enlargement and things, they may suffer from stress and whatnot. So loads of other problems might come. So look at these clear stuff that I've given you. I'll share this with you. You can take a look at all of this. Last bit of this, guys, we got leadership styles. So four leadership styles, autocratic, tell, do this. Um, paternalistic, ask, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? But at the end of the day, I make the decision. Father figure, yeah, I'll ask, but I'll, I'll, I'll make the decision in the end. Democratic, all of us together, let's make a decision. Laissez-faire, well, I, you know what you're doing, so you do it. Uh, I don't need to make a decision. You just you just do what you're doing. I trust you. These are like doctors, guys. You don't tell the doctor how to go operate, how, or the surgeon how to go operate on the patient. Yeah, that's a fair in those. Autocratic, the army. Paternalistic, someone like me. I kind of ask people all the time, but at the end of the day, I make my final decision. So I don't know. I, I feel that I'm, I'm that kind of leader. Democratic, we all get together and do things. This is like in a high skill organization or something like that, where you get to know things and do things on your own together. So that's democratic. Um, entrepreneurs and leaders, we're coming towards the end, guys. The entrepreneurs and leaders section, we don't have too much in here. There's very few things that are very important. You can refer all the others. There are stages of setting up a business. So you need the idea, you have to do some research, plan it out get the money because you can't do it without that. Only with the plan, you can get the money. Without the plan, you can't go to a bank and approach it for money. Get the money, go find a location, go find your suppliers and resources, launch. Simple as that. Have your stages set. And finally, entrepreneurs. Your question is going to come in, say, evaluate uh, the case study and uh, find out the skills or characteristics of entrepreneur XYZ. Now you need to find, was he self-confident? Was he determined? Was he a risk taker? You can even put risk taker as a characteristic there. Did he have good judgment? Yeah. Was he persevere? Was he resilient? When he fell, he got back up. Yeah. Those are characteristics. What is it? The type of person. Skills. Certain skills you need to have. Specifically, IT skills. If you are a new entrepreneur and you don't have IT skills like presentation or presentation not so needed, you don't have social media skills or don't know how to use spreadsheets and designing posters and all that, you're out. You can't be an entrepreneur. Today's day, you need this. You'll also need financial management, know how to manage money, know how to manage cost. Yeah. Communicate well, especially with your staff, manage your staff well, be a good negotiator and decision maker, organize things well, certain skills. Pretty generic as this list can go on and on and on. There's no particular list here. 
And of course, you got motives. Why? Reasons. Reasons. Profit maximize, profit satisfies. This is financial. Profit maximize to earn the most profit. Profit satisfies just to earn enough to sustain your way of life. You know, kind of just enough. This is enough for me. Yeah, but I want some profit, but they're just enough. Sometimes ethical, some businesses like Embark, Otara, they want to go with that. Social enterprises, independent. Sometimes you want to be your own boss. Sometimes you just want to work from home, guys. Why should you go to work every day, early morning when you can work from home? Alrighty, that concludes our knowledge refresher workshop. And we've just finished, we touched on every single area that came into unit two. Of course, there are bits and pieces we may have left out, but we pulled in the most important things. Now, anyone here has any questions on what we just did? You can either drop it in the chat box and I'll answer it, or you can unmute yourselves and ask me and I'll answer it. Keep sending them in, guys. We'll take it all, look at it together. Uh, Adil, you had something as well? Uh, I'm going to give you all a minute to keep sending in your questions and I will answer them for you, yeah? Okay, I got two questions for the moment. If anyone else has any questions, you got a minute to send it in. If not, I'm going to answer them and call it with that. Now's your chance, get anything clarified and I will answer them for you. Okay, I'm getting a good amount of question. Keep it coming. Okay, I take it as that's all the questions. So I'm going to start answering it. Um, Abu Sheriff had a question saying, is centralized tall or flat? Now, centralized is generally for a tall structure. Why? In a tall structure, you're given all your duties to do. This person can handle only this much. Assistant manager can only do so much. Manager can only do so much. A system manager needs to approve something a higher limit. It has to go to the higher one. So as you can see, guys, this tall structure tends to be more centralized. That is what they do, guys. As opposed to a flat structure, guys. Flat structure, you have one and so many employees doing a lot of things, no? You give them some form of autonomy and they make their own decisions. Yeah? They make their own decisions. So that is that is one way of looking at it. Yeah? Um, could you counter argue to say that flat structure is centralized? Yes, you can. You can say, look, I'm the boss, just do this. Tendency, Abu Sheriff, tendency is that it's going to be in a tall structure. Yeah. Could it be in the other one? Yes. Tendency, no, I'd go with. 
uh, thought. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. So the reason why flat structures are very decentralized is because they allow these people to go and make their own decisions, guys. They tell them also you can go do this, do that. Yeah, and you get because they are kind of like um, could be either yes, but more towards tall. I would stick with tall because it's the flat one, guys. You're telling everybody to go. Um, you're giving them more power, right? Because you have only a few people. You're giving them more power to do whatever they have to do. The more you give them more power, guys, it's becoming decentralized. No? Yeah, because if you uh, technically in a flat structure, everyone is similar to they're like the owners. Yeah, they have some sort of power there. As opposed to the tall structure guy, you think the junior guy can do what's uh, what the senior guy has power for? No, senior guy will make the decision. The tall is generally centralized. It can go. You can decentralize any or even a tall cent uh, structure can decentralize, but tendency tall structure. Question number two, in qualitative, which is more efficient, Alifia, be specific in what? Uh, uh, central. Uh, okay, go on. Uh, centralization and decentralization? No, you cannot say which is more efficient in that, Alifia. You've got to argue both sides. you got to say this is good, um, but this is also good. Yeah? So you got to argue both. You cannot stick with one side in your answers. Yeah, argue both sides. Give advantages, give disadvantages. Um, where it is efficient, Alifia, depends. Like if you're in, in times of a crisis when you need to make a sudden decision, centralize. Don't decentralize at that point. Don't let everyone make decisions. You just say, everyone, listen up. I'm making the decisions. And you do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Question two. In qualitative and quantitative methods, which is open to most interpretation and why? So the more, I mean, qualitative is open to the most interpretation there. Why? Because it's on beliefs, it's on attitudes, it's on the qualities, it's on their ways of life, it's on the way they think. So that's open to the most, as opposed to numbers. This, that tells you a, a limited thing. So numbers are very narrowed, guys. Now, numbers are very, uh, how would you say, uh, generally qualitative questions tend to be open-ended. Yeah. Quantitative tends to be close and there's only one answer to it. How many times do you buy this a week? Uh, which ones do you prefer? How many, how many, you know, so whenever you ask your close question is generally, a uh, sorry, when you ask uh, quantitative is generally a close question, so it's less interpretation there, as opposed to qualitative because the answer, they are very open-ended. Um, Sajini, I hope I answered that. Um, next question says, during product growth stage, is it effective to have a patent against pump? Don't. Um, okay, just repeating the question. During product growth stage, is it effective to have a patent against competitors to protect yourself? Why in the growth stage? If you didn't introduce a patent in the introduction stage, people have already copied you. You can't even claim a patent in the growth stage. It's too late. Yeah? Introduction, either you take it before you introduce it, because once you introduce, there are copycats waiting for you. They will take it. Yeah, so be careful of that. So uh, ideally, not in the growth, maybe during the uh, introduction stage. Uh, what's the point? Yeah, they have already copied it and whatnot. Sajini, is that okay? Ali says... Uh, so it's the most effective doing. Yeah, bef like right before you get into intro, like after, right after the development stage, get the patent. Because if that leaks out, it's too late. You can't do anything. If they, What if they file the patent before you? You can't stop them. So it's more effective right before you launch. The moment you launch, the copycats will copy it. Yeah, get the patent before you launch. Ideally in the development stage, right after the development stage. Ali's brought in a question, in factors affecting demand, there was a factor as branding, but isn't it more towards ostentatious demand? Yes, it is, yeah. Branding will always be ostentatious, be towards, you know, people who want to get the brand to, you know, show people that they have the brand, yeah. So branding is, obviously, but branding is one of the biggest factors, guys. 
anything is branding. Yeah, anything and everything, the branding counts, the branding will make you inelastic. That is really, really helped. It has to be a properly developed brand. Yeah. Um, branding was what really helped us, Jade, rather survive through a pandemic. We had no problems at all because we invested in branding. That made us more inelastic. Nobody, we had no problems. We are, in fact, one of the businesses that grew through a pandemic. While others were falling, we started growing. Only one reason, brand. Yeah. Ali, does that answer your question? Abu Sharif, so it could, okay, that's fine, which is more efficient. Ali again, in Boston Matrix, if there is high market growth and low market share, then high market growth, okay, and low market share, the question mark, then when the market growth keeps increasing, then does the market share keep falling? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. If the market growth, if the market is growing and your share is still staying the same, then technically your market share keep falling. Yeah. So you need to keep up with the market growth. If your market is growing and you're not growing, then technically you're owning a smaller proportion. No? If more people are coming in, now for example, if you were 100 sales and you had 20%, uh, 20 sales, you had 20%, but that 100 sales turned 200 sales and you're still at 20 sales, you're only 10%. So you need to keep up. Ali, does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions, guys? What's the difference between market mapping and Boston matrix? Both of them help identify gaps and strengths and weaknesses. Market mapping is for competitors, Pimsara. You're mapping all your competitors in the market. Yeah. Boston Matrix is an internal tool. You put your own products in that. Yeah. Boston Matrix is mainly to analyze the internals. Could you use external? Possible, but nobody uses it for external. We're using it to analyze our internal portfolio. It's called a portfolio analysis. Another word for Boston Matrix is portfolio analysis. And portfolio means all your products, your assets, your everything. Yeah, your, your main things that are selling. So you are analyzing, okay, this product. Now, if you take uh, Toyota, Toyota will say, okay, uh, the Toyota Hiace is a star, keep selling. Um, Toyota, something else, maybe a uh, Starlet, maybe now uh, Cash Cow. Yeah. Uh, Corolla now towards to a, a dog. I don't know. You can put it wherever you are. You're analyzing your portfolio. Vincent, does that make sense? It's more an internal thing. All right. Any other questions? Product portfolio is similar to product umbrella. Now, product umbrella is where you uh, take all the brands under your, uh, you check all the brands under your uh, umbrella. It's actually called umbrella branding. Uh, but product portfolio is a very specific tool, Sajini, that is being used for uh, analyzing your portfolio only. Product umbrella is not in your syllabus for you to study here. You only have the product portfolio. Is that okay? Um, I got just five more minutes if anyone's got questions. If not, we're going to halt it with that. One more round. Anyone got anything else? All righty. Then if that's it, guys, we're going to halt it with that. Thank you for attending the free workshop that we had. Now, the thing is, we have another series coming up called the Great Booster Series. If you want to know more about that, speak to um, speak to the hotline number. You can get the details from them. There we'll be looking at anticipated questions. We'll be doing the writing structure. We'll be doing model answers, a little more tips and tricks that will come in. And that will run up all the way up till your exams. Today, we're done with the workshop for knowledge refresher. More details to follow. Speak to um, speak to the people at uh, Shrubbery Gardens, 07739 if you want to know more about uh, uh, other workshops coming up. So 
that's it from my end. I hope you guys enjoyed. Leave us some feed, uh, feedback maybe on social media. We'll put up a post. Maybe you can drop us some feedback if you really enjoyed it. Tell us what you'd like us to do in future so we can help you further. We're always here to help. We always come in at the last minute to help you guys because that is what that's how we started and that's how we'd like to keep it. So let us know how we, else we could help you guys. Um, drop us some feedback on social media. Until I see you guys sometimes in future, take care guys and stay safe.